Welcome back. It's time for our first hot topic, and we have been joined by Reverend John Hayab, who is the chairman of Can Kaduna State. I want to take a look at the situation unfolding with regards to the coup in Niger, President Tinubu, ECOWAS, and the dilemma as the deadline has expired on Sunday. Good morning, Reverend. Okay. okay so, good uh, morning. Yeah, good morning. Can all you right. hear me? Yes. So, Reverend, let, let's first of all take your views on this coup. What do you make of it? First, I would say it is sad, it is unfortunate that we are back to the era of coup d'etat. Though in the ECOWAS region, this is not the first. In the last few years, we've had Burkina Faso and others. Since coup started in 1963, and actually in Togo, we've been having one coup or the other within the, sub, uh, within the ECOWAS region and actually in other parts of Africa. Coup, as we know, what everybody, anybody or any right-thinking person should clap for. It's not what anybody should support. It's not what anybody should speak favorable about. But it is happening. Unfortunately, the democratic institutions have also not helped matters. They have not helped to make people or convince people that really we need to all reject coup. We need to say no to coup. Because when you look at what is happening in Niger, since the coup, the people are celebrating as if they have won a, football, a World Cup. And you know that this is actually the attitude of every country when there's a coup. People will celebrate as if they have gotten relief, not knowing that after a few months they will go back to uh, a terrible situation. But this is the situation when you have poor governance, when you have bad process of electing leaders, who uh, will come. And when it comes, people will ignorantly support it and think that it is something good because they are angry with the system, they are angry with the way things are going on. Nidat, we thought, had had, would not have anything to go back because there are two key things that I have actually reflected about. Number one, uh, if you look at Niger, the last president of Nigeria or the immediate past president of Nigeria had a lot to do with Niger during his tenure. He, he, he actually brought about so many projects that will connect Nigeria and Niger. Uh, some Nigerians can even say by the side that, look, uh, Niger that is an Nigerian. Unfortunately, when he just left power, then the coup, uh, the dream uh, has just came over and took over power. So what is that? And what is that telling us? Then Tinubu is coming, angry that we're supposed not to go back to the era of coup d'etat, and is marshalling or is making some pronouncement that also has its own implication. So this is the challenge we are facing at the moment. All right. So now the deadline given to them to reinstate Mohamed Bazoum expired yesterday. What should be the next? War, silence, or dialogue? I think from the onset, uh, I didn't actually clap for the, uh, the actions or the statements or the direction that ECOWAS and Hachia were actually taking. Because, you see, we have to be honest with ourselves about Niger. Niger's Shia boundary with almost about seven states of Nigeria. If you go to war with Niger, you just get ready that those seven states are going to have an influx of refugees. So <laughs> who are you fighting with? It's like Nigeria. Uh, or Benin, saying that they want to fight uh, Nigeria, but they want to fight Idiroko. And being a republic, know very much that a large number of those who are Idiroko have connect to do with Benin. So how do you fight that? Same thing if Nigeria wants to go and fight. They may say, no, we want to go after the Juntas. How can you go after the Juntas without touching on civilians, without affecting the general populace? So I would subscribe that dialogue would have been the most important thing because if we dialogue with them, we'll be able to have better understanding and then just give them a space that won't be long for them to give way and let us restore democratic institutions. But for us to say that we want to go after them, we want to send our military to do that, how have we done with Boko Haram around? How have we done with the bandits that have been tormenting us? What have we done with IPOC? What have we done with other people that have been creating unnecessary security tension in Nigeria? We couldn't solve that problem and we think we want to go and... Uh, get rid of uh, juntas elsewhere. Well, in our country, people are even grumbling, people are complaining. I felt that it was just a show of force that has no meaning. I wish our government wouldn't have even said that in the first place, because if now they do not go after them after the seven days ultimatum, mm -hmm. they will now begin to be seen as a weak uh, echoers. So they just went to say what they're supposed not to say in the first place. 
I, I do not know. Uh, does, that, does that tell us that a Tinubu presidency uh, or a Tinubu chair of ECOWAS is going to produce next to no results? Can we judge his... Well, uh, we may yeah. not say next to no results. We don't know what they have or what they want to do. But we simply, as Nigerians, will advise that any action that needs to be taken, certain things must be put into consideration. Well, do you see a West African ECOWAS, any kind of intervention from ECOWAS having any kind of bite? Mm -hmm. Considering. Yeah. Reverend. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, 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 sadly, we, are, we seem to be having audio disconnection. Mm -hmm. Hello, Reverend, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Okay, we may need to, um, I was going to ask if, you know, because ECOWAS over the years uh, is, is now being seen as, as a weak mm -hmm. organization, mm -hmm. including the AU, yeah. you know, including the AU. And so one begins to wonder, uh, one begins to wonder how much bite, how much influence, how much uh, authority does ECOWAS carry these days? Yeah, Would an intervention from ECOWAS mean anything to the coupists? A lot, a lot of people who are talking about this issue are saying uh, the legitimacy of the people who constitute the ECOWAS community, that the leaders of the ECOWAS community, uh, is in question. So how can someone who, uh, whose integrity, whose legitimacy is questioned, be the person to tell another person that what you're doing is wrong? Okay, so, uh, sorry to take words from your mouth, but I hear that Reverend Hayab, the connectivity is back. Hello, Reverend, can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, so and I so was... The second part of it is not just the legitimacy of ECOWAS leaders. Okay. The second part of it is that how far have ECOWAS leaders really proved to give the people they are governing good governance? Mm -hmm. Since there is bad governance in virtually all the ECOWAS country. You see, they have tempted the Quintas to now come and tell the people that they have something better to offer. Mm -hmm. I have said this several times, and I want to repeat here, that when a democratic elected government celebrates democratic success as construction of roads, then there is a problem. When a democratic elected president celebrates the success of democracy as building houses, then something is wrong. Because even Quintas can build houses. Even junters can construct roads. So what separates a, mil a, a, a democratic leadership and military dictatorship is simply the freedom. Are Africans free? Are West African people free? Are they free with their leaders? Do we have press freedom? Can we truly exercise our right as citizens? So they have failed in this thing. So when others challenge them about legitimacy, then people also look at them that what makes democratic democracy a true government is not even there. It's mm -hmm. no freedom. So people are actually slaves in their country, and they know very well that these civilians were their friends yesterday, they were their neighbors two days ago, and just because they became senators or they became federal representatives or they became governors or they became president, and suddenly they became around so that he has the might, he has the power to challenge them and stop them, people would clap for him. So I think our leaders in ECOWAS must sit up. One, ensure that there is good governance. Two, ensure that it is democracy we are practicing, not some kind of autocratic governance sitting on people's neck and even making mockery of the pains people are going through. That is why dictators or junta's are having their way back to governance. And truly speaking, if we don't take steps to correct this, it don't belong. More other countries will join. Mm. All right. Well, there, has, there, there was a threat of military intervention, mm. and even the president, our president, had sought approval from the Senate, which was turned down. Um, earlier in the week, Burkina Faso, the military junta's in Mali and Burkina Faso, had said that any sort of intervention from ECOWAS any, will be seen as a declaration of war. This is not looking good I for the region. I our senators for showing maturity and not giving in to that cheap request and rejecting the request. Though they also make... Connectivity this morning. Hello, Reverend. 
Okay, so um, <laughs> Burkina Faso, the joint ties in Burkina Faso and, and Mali have mm. said, you know, they are aligning with the Niger mm. and they are saying any form of military intervention, anything that is not acceptable to Niger is not acceptable to them. My worry is, like my people say, when a small child insults you in the early morning, look behind. An adult may be there that may be pushing him. Mm -hmm. So who is this adult uh, behind Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and all that? Because these, peop these people, these countries, none of them is as big as Lagos State. Mm -hmm. uh, the population in Lagos is more than some of these countries that are making mouth, as we say in Nigeria, with Nigeria. We still are a big brother in terms of might, in, stem, in terms of money, in terms of everything. But they can talk this way. That means there is someone somewhere who is putting the flame, uh, putting the fire, and making sure that they can talk like this with confidence. And if those people are still Western powers, then it is just moving from fry pan to fire. So if Nigerians, or not Nigerians now, Africans are looking for a way to break away from this colonialism, are they breaking away totally? from colonialism, or they just want a new slave master. That's what I'm asking myself, and I'm, I'm worried about that. Can they stand on their own and do what they're doing? Now, Niger, that we're talking about, they're chanting on the streets and saying, long live Putin. So they're not having meetings in Russia. So instead of um, paying I mean, allegiance to... Russian yes, flags. Yes, in, in Niger. So they're leaving France for Russia. They're leaving France for China. They're leaving France for Germany and other well, countries. Well, sadly, they are saying that Russia is treating them with respect, unlike France. And then the question is, for how long is this going to go on, as you have mm -hmm. said? But again, no man is an island, right? And it's the failure of AU and ECOWAS as giving birth and giving room for these kind of alliances that they are craving for and accepting. Because if ECOWAS and AU, you, you remember during Mama and Gaddafi, one of the things he sought to establish was a, a united... African front. Mm -hmm. He wanted Africa to unite against the West. Unfortunately, he was betrayed, even mm -hmm. by someone who, well, I was watching the documentary. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, Reverend. Hey, you know. Hiya, peace yeah, back. Beautiful. I actually uh, enjoyed the line of discussion you are having. I think we must acknowledge the fact that uh, there is a solidarity by all the Tuntas presently in West Africa. Mm. So if we think that uh, there are separate countries, there is solidarity from Burkina Faso, there is solidarity from other countries with Niger Junta. So let's be careful because we will start a war that we will not finish. We may be thinking that those countries are small, but you see there is power in unity. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other countries that we are thinking that may be with us, yeah, people are also angry with their leaders. And when this war starts, they may have some factions among the military that will not go with them. So it's something that we cannot guarantee success. And that's why we're advising that our leaders must be careful and toy the part of dialogue. That's one. Number two, you talked about the presence of uh, Russia and China. Russia is already having a challenge with many European countries and even the global world. Mm. So she's looking for partners. She's looking for allies. She's looking for people who will so, so that to with her. So ordinarily, Russia will go with them. Russia will support them because Russia, if you look at Putin governance altogether has been more of military might. So since they are military junta's, you will just identify with them, identify with some democratic people that tomorrow will be influenced by US or influenced by UK. So he will now identify with the junta's. And so they will have support. I want to sincerely appeal that we must find a better approach by using dialogue to find solution and then go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves. What have we, we been doing wrong that is now attracting and bringing back juntas that they are staging coup d'etat? When we address those things, then we will stop anything in the future. But I don't see any meaningful success at the moment. Even if those countries are small, they are united, the juntas are together, and they are threatening. They can just disgrace us and humiliate us in the face of the earth. Mm. Is it looking like Niger is, is becoming like the greatest challenge for ECOWAS yet since we've seen this wave of coups? I mean, we've seen it in Burkina Faso, Mali, Sudan, Chad. But here we are at this point where it does seem as if this Niger coup is become a major challenge for ECOWAS. Or why the yeah, interest? There's so much interest in Niger. Mm -hmm. 
no, this is not far fetched. Number one, Nigeria is actually Nigeria. Nigeria is Nigeria. Let's be honest with ourselves. Nigeria and Nigeria is just like a father and a star. A large number of Nigerian states have many of their siblings in Nigeria. And a large people in Nigeria have their siblings in Nigeria. Uh, I, have, I keep repeating here that Nigeria is a country with about seven states in Nigeria. Go to that state and take a thorough statistics of people who are living in that state. You'll find that Nigeria, Nigeria constitutes a large number of, such, of people from uh, of, those, of those states. So there are lots of things we share in common. Religion, eco, uh, agriculture, and many things, culture, we share in common. Sometimes when we do elections in Nigeria and people used to cry and say people are brought outside Nigeria to come on board, this is the picture. Let's be honest to ourselves and start to stop pretending. Now you are fighting people who think that you are fighting their brothers, people who think you are fighting their siblings, people who think you are fighting their nearest neighbor and ally. See, the first people that will betray the war will be Nigerians. Nigerians from those who have affinity, who have attachment with the Jack, will betray the war. So our government must not be blind and must not assume all is well. It is not well. So Nigeria had to come in because Nigeria is that close. The, the affinity between Nigeria and Nigeria is too close compared to other African countries. Go and check the map and you will see no other country has such large number of uh, boundary connect like Nigeria and Nigeria. So a lot of things we have in common. We may not have. Why did the previous leader continue to bring in some kind of economic de uh, development to Niger? Because there is this attachment connected with them. So now that Niger is having problem, I'm happy that at least the government have done something right by sending uh, General Abdul Abdul and the Sultan and uh, Hassan Tukur, uh, the former chief of staff to Jonathan, uh, no, the former uh, DPS to Jonathan, to go and mediate. We just hope that such engagement and conversation could eventually give us solution. But I also do not want a situation where we think that they must come back to democracy right now, right now, right now, or else we are going to go to war with them. The people are celebrating that overturn of government. So what are you talking about? If you bring back the governor or the president that was coupled, is he going to immediately restore sanity, restore uh, uh, confidence? No. So you have a better way of discussing, and then politicians must learn from this. Now, what do we do to win the confidence, the trust of the people that we are governing? Because the people have the power. You may have been given the mandate, but the power still belongs to the people. Mm. Okay, uh, Reverend John Hayab, I uh, would like to thank you for coming on the show this morning. Uh, your thoughts are very concise and educating. So we do hope that Nigeria or Africa will emerge better uh, out of these conflicts and not plunge ourselves into more conflict uh, than we already are. Thank you so much for your time on the show this morning. Thank you too for having me. God bless. That was uh, Reverend Joseph John Hayab, Chairman Khan, Kaduna State, talking uh, with us. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll take on another topic still related to this. Stay with us. <laughs>